Welcome to First Bite, our Pride of Detroit preview podcast for your Detroit Lions. It's the regular season. It's week one. Detroit Lions versus San Francisco 49ers. We're here to preview it. My name is Jeremy Reisman. I'm the editor-in-chief at Pride of Detroit. You can find me at Detroit Online. With me, as always, as my co-host is Ryan Matthews, senior editor of Pride of Detroit at Ryan underscore POD. Ryan, how are we doing tonight? Football is in the air, Jeremy. We're right around the corner. Yes. We made it. We we finally <laughs> made it through one of the most interesting Lions off seasons, uh, probably in history. Uh, but um, we're here to talk about the 49ers. And with us to talk about the 49ers is a returning guest, uh, one of our rare returning guests here on First Bite. He talked to us about Robert Sala in the off season. He's back with us today. He's from the NBC Sports Bay Arena uh, for the San Francisco 49ers on the beat there. Matt Mayoko is here. Matt, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm just happy I made the cut. I'm happy that I was on. I didn't embarrass myself too much. You got me back on. So yes, I'm, I'm fired up. And before we start, do you guys know the history here? First 49ers Super Bowl. This is the 40th anniversary season of that. Oh. Their first game in 1981 was at Detroit. Oh, what in happened Pontiac, in that game? Still yeah, against the Lions. Do you yeah. remember what happened in that game? I think the Lions won. It's a good premonition. I think the Lions won. All right. Gosh, I should know that, huh? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Sorry to put you I'll on the spot. That, well, that'll be a teaser. We'll, exactly. I'm sure I'm sure your uh, your viewers and listeners will, will be able to come in here. But uh, yeah, I think they... Uh, it's my recollection they won that game. The Lions. People, are, people are feverishly Googling away right now. <laughs> yes, they are. Well, let's uh, let's start with the coaching staff there. You, you talked to us about Robert Sala. Obviously, he's uh, the big departure this offseason, and he took a lot of coaches with him, uh, both on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. But the 49ers did what a good organization does, which is kind of just promote from within. They, they build their coaching staff from the depths. And so my question to you is just, does it, has it been a seamless transition so far? Obviously, you don't have the results on the regular season yet, but does it seem like you know there, there's no worry about maybe you know four or five coaches leaving this offseason? No, because I think there was enough continuity. You know, they promoted D'Amico Ryans from linebackers coach, very highly thought of coach and a guy that would not be surprised if he's not a coordinator for too long, that he kind of has that, yeah. that head coaching look to him. And so D'Amico Ryans came in and he didn't switch up things other than maybe the mindset a little bit with Robert Sala coming from that Seattle defense you know, it was, it was a pretty conservative approach. You know, a lot of zone, just keep the ball in front of you. Uh, they didn't do a whole lot of crazy stuff. You know, their, their coverages were, you know, you, you knew what you're getting when you face them, put it that way. And so what D'Amico Ryans wants to do is he wants to be more aggressive. He wants to get after the quarterback. He wants to turn the front four loose and then just kind of clean things up on the backside and, and so I think that their cornerback situation is such that they can do more coverages. They're going to be more aggressive. Corey Unlin is now the, mm -hmm. the passing game specialist. So he, you know, he's not in a, a coordinator position, but he's working with the defensive backs and helping kind of tie things up on the back end. And then they brought in James Betcher, who was a defense coordinator with the Cardinals and the Giants known as very aggressive. So I think that D'Amico Ryans will, will be incorporating a little bit of, of all that. But I know earlier this offseason, or not in the offseason, but during training camp, talking to both those guys, Unlin and Betcher, guys who have sat in that coordinator chair, you know, how much is how much do you help uh, D'Amico Ryans? How much does he lean on you? And both of those guys said, he's got it. You know, we, we're here if, if he has questions for us. But he's, it's not like this newbie's coming in there and just not even knowing what he's doing. He has a very good idea of what he's doing. So I do think that there are elements of the 49ers pass defense, obviously, but it'll be, you know, as much as the 49ers go into this wondering what they're going to see from the Lions, because that's a new coaching staff, there is also an element of, of the Detroit offense kind of not knowing exactly how the 49ers are going to approach them because there's nothing really on film yet with these two, uh, with the 49ers defense. And then of course with the lions offense and defense. Yeah. And, and Matt, thanks again for, for joining us on first bite, but you talk about newbies, you talk about maybe not having a whole lot of, you know, offensive film that they can go off of the lions. I want to talk about, you know, Trey Lance, 
the number three overall pick and what the 49ers have in terms of expectations for him. I know recently, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo is the starter, but do you expect Trey Lance um, to, to play it all on Sunday? And uh, if so, is it certain packages? How much does that injury, you know, influence or factor into his playing time and, and things like that? Well, right now it, it's very much up in the air. You know, Kyle Shanahan has said that, you know, he wants Jimmy Garoppolo to play. Garoppolo played the 2019 season in North Dakota State, and then the 2020 season was wiped out. So basically, he hasn't played other than the preseason games. He's played one game in the past year and a half, so almost two years. So that's they don't want him to go another year without playing. So they want him to play. But now on the very short term, in the final preseason games, a game he was throwing a pass, his, his hand hit a helmet, and so he has a, a fracture, a, just a, a chipped bone in the index finger of his throwing hand. So that was shown up on an MRI. When that, would that have been? That would have been uh, not this last Monday, but the Monday before. The hope at that point was that he was going to be out seven days, and then it would just they would just resume you know normal practice activity. However, on Monday when we were out there at practice. The splint was off of his index finger, but he still wasn't handling a football. You know, he wasn't taking snaps, not even shotgun snaps, and he wasn't throwing the football. He was going through the mechanics of of the footwork drills and everything else without a football. So one of the players that the 49ers pr uh, protected from their practice squad this week is quarterback Nate Sudfeld. Whether Sudfeld is the backup, if you know, we, we'll see. I mean, if Trey Lance isn't cleared to play, then Sudfeld will be the backup. If Trey Lance is cleared to play and he's deemed healthy and he can throw the ball and he can do all those things, then yes, I think there will be some package. Um, that last exhibition game, if you guys, if, I'm sure you didn't see it. I hope you didn't. Oh, I hope you guys have lives and were able to do something <laughs> Ooh, else. But, yeah. but what they Wrong did, show. the first, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the first two series of that game against the Raiders, Garoppolo started, played three snaps. Gar uh, Lance went in, played three or four snaps. Garoppolo came in, and so they did that. The first two series of that game, the 49ers had 24 offensive plays. Garoppolo ran 14, Lance ran 10. I don't expect them to do that, but I think just for the preseason, it was good for them to kind of get that whole, the mechanics of that down, of one guy being on the sideline, running into the game, getting the personnel and the and the the play call in his helmet, and then relaying that to the, his teammates. So I think what's going to happen once they kind of settle in is for every game, it's going to be game plan specific on the defense they're facing and how they can exploit the defense. And sometimes, you know, Trey Lance might play a snap or two. Who knows? He might not even play any snaps. Other times he could play 10, 12 snaps. So everybody's guessing yeah. uh, along with all of us, uh, you know, along with the Lions. Uh, right. Everybody here is guessing, like, what are we going to see? And the 49ers – you know, even their offensive players as, as late as yesterday said they have no idea what to expect this week <laughs> as far as that quarterback rotation or just how they plan to play the quarterbacks on Sunday against the Lions. Yeah, I mean, they, they seem to keep their quarterback intentions pretty well hidden as, as evidenced by the draft as well. Um, but uh, but let's talk about Garoppolo. So it seems like he's going to be the guy that we see the majority of on, on Sunday. Um, what does he look like in camp? Um, is, is he a guy that maybe could hold on to the, the starting position all year? Yeah, he is. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are certain things just experience wise, uh, quick release. I mean, he's more accurate right now than, than Trey Lance certainly has a better read of the offense and probably uh, decision making a little bit more crisp as you would expect all those things from a guy who's been in the league for as long as he has. So yeah, he can definitely hold on to the to the job. I think, you know, they, they've done this job. They've since he's been the quarterback and he came here in the middle of the 2017 season uh this was his best training camp now last year they didn't have a training camp oh, right you know one year he was coming off an acl injury so all he was doing was rehabbing uh his first off season he was basically learning the offense from scratch because uh in 2017 he was learning it basically on a game plan 
by game plan basis. So I guess that's ultimately, it's not saying a whole lot that this was his best training camp you would expect it to be. But, you know, in 2019, he had a good season. You know, not a great season, but he had a, a very good season. And the 49ers went to the Super Bowl. I think what they're looking for this year is for him to run the offense. You know, the, the, it's going to be a defense and, and run-oriented team. But there will be plenty of opportunities to be to have plays in the passing game just because of the, the structure of the of the offense. And, you know, the one thing that Garoppolo did in 2019 that he can definitely improve on is the giveaways, you know, too many interceptions. So that's the area where they can tighten this up. But you know, I think by and large, they feel like the offense and the defense are good enough that they don't need a quarterback to just put the team on his shoulders and go win a game. So ultimately, I think that's what they're looking for. And hey, if the 49ers are winning and Garoppolo's playing you know, well, he's going to stay as the quarterback, I would think. Um, you know, you, you would think that Trey Lance will, the more he plays, the better he'll get, but it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, you know, Trey Lance had a really good training camp, but I don't get the sense that they're in the position right now where they feel like they want to sacrifice the potential of having victories over getting this guy ready, meaning Trey Lance, getting him ready for 2022 and 2023. I think with this team, it's a, by and large, it's a veteran team. They, they have signed some guys to some big money contracts. They brought a lot of veteran guys back on one year deals. It's all about this year and, and whichever quarterback gives them the best chance of winning football games this year is the guy that they have to go with. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, if, if we could say one thing about the, the 49ers, I guess year as a whole last year, it's like injuries, right? Injuries, injuries, injuries for a team that just made the Super Bowl a year prior to that. Um, you know, all the injuries that they dealt with this year, you know, they get back Debo Samuel on offense. George Kittle missed a significant amount of time last year. It seems like adding Trey Lance to that cosmic gumbo that they have in San Francisco it, it seems like maybe they want to go maybe more towards an oriented, uh, a pass oriented tech, even though you do mention, you know, it's kind of predicated on a defense and a ground game. How much of that do you think changes once the almost inevitable changeover in guard from Garoppolo to Lance happens? Do you think that there's a big shift in, in what they can do offensively with Lance versus Garoppolo? I just, I just feel like they're a running team, you know, and yeah. I think they'll always be a running team. I mean, their run scheme is, is pretty solid and, you know, they got probably the two best run blocking tackles in the game in Trent Williams and Mike McGlinchey. McGlinchey and Mike McGlinchey yeah. didn't, he didn't have a great season as a pass blocker. That's going to be a focus this year, but as a run blocker, those two guys are really good. And as, as much of a factor as George Kittle is in the passing game, he might be a better run blocker than he is as a pass catcher, which yeah. is crazy to think. <laughs> I mean, he absolutely loves that part of it. So they're going to try to run the ball. You know, they're going to run it on Sunday. They're going to, they're going to try to kind of impose their will on the Lions. And by running the ball effectively and, and having that threat of the run, that's where they use the passing game. You know, last year, or I should say, let's go back to the Super Bowl year because that's probably more applicable. You know, there's probably only one game the whole year, maybe two, where they just said, Garoppolo go win a game and that was, one of them was in New Orleans where it just kind of got into a shootout and Jimmy Garoppolo stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Drew Brees and, and he threw the ball around the, the field and ultimately on a fourth and short play late in the game he hit George Kittle on a short pass and Kittle turned it into a 40-yard reception throw on a 15-yard face mask penalty at the end and the 49ers kicked the winning field goal right. so I, I really think that, yeah, they do have weapons in the passing game, but really the secret sauce is that it's all predicated on their ability to run the football and run it well. And with Raheem Mostert, they have an absolute home run hitter with that speed. And then we really didn't see much in the preseason of Trey Sermon. They picked him in the, the third round from Ohio State, but I know they like him. And he's one of these guys that, you, you know, from, from game to game, they'll go with the hot hand. And if, if the defense is stuffing 
Mostert and Sermon gets in there and breaks off a couple of big ones, then it's going to be Trey Sermon's game. But that's where they they want to lean. They want to get the lead early. They want to crush defense's spirit, and they just want to continue to run the ball and protect leads in the second half. Well, before we move on to the defense in the second segment here, uh, one more thing on, on the offense, because, you know, to, to win in the ground game, you got to have a, a stout offensive line. And, and you mentioned the tackles that they've got. They also added Alex Mack center this offseason, uh, a veteran presence there. What about the rest of the offensive line? Because I think that's a fascinating matchup against the Lions where there may be only strength on their entire rosters right there in the middle and at defensive tackle. So so 49ers might have their hands full, but but what do you think of their guard play so far? Um, you know, I think, well, you guys might be surprised at this one. Lake and Tomlinson's turned into a yeah. really good guard. Yeah. We've heard, we've yeah. heard. Yeah. And you know, it was rough his first year. I think that trade was made, you know, right before the start of the season. So he was, you know, he was getting acclimated to it. And I know Martin Mayhew at the time was with the 49ers. They brought him over mm-hmm. and it was, it was an adjustment for him with the, the zone, outside zone blocking scheme, but yeah, you know, uh, 2019 and, and last season, uh, I thought Lake and Tomlinson played very well. So I think they feel good about him. Alex Mack is getting up there in age. You know, he he wasn't com- you know he didn't commit himself to playing this season until he kind of saw what what was out there, and he liked the the opportunity to come back to California and play for Kyle Shanahan. Daniel Brunskill is is the other he kind of a jack of all trades offensive lineman. In 2018 and 2019, he played uh, the uh, tackle positions. Actually, I think it was 2019. He played tackle, backup right tackle, backup left tackle. Uh, last season, they moved him into guard when they were having trouble at center. He moved to center. So now he's back at right guard. And the 49ers drafted Aaron Banks in the second round from Notre Dame to basically take that job. Well, Banks doesn't really seem to be a good fit for this system. Hmm. You know, it takes, it takes a while and he got injured. And so it's going to be Brunskill. I, I think when you look at the 40 hours offensive line uh, compared to last year, I would imagine that Trent Williams will be about the same as Trent Williams is. Yep. I, I think McGlinchy is going to be a better player on the right side, just because of his age and really the focus on pass protection. I think their center guard, their center play is going to be improved because Alex Mack steps in. And I think Lakin Tomlinson will be around the same guy that he was. And I think Brunskill will be better at right guard. So I think all in all, I, I think this offensive line will be much better than it was last season. And, and kind of the guy that ties it all together is Alex Mack. You know, we, we don't know what he has physically, but mentally um, and just kind of keeping everybody on the same page. That's a, that's a big thing for the, for the, for the center position in this offense. So um, I, I think that'll be a good matchup on, on Sunday. Um, obviously the lions get the advantage a little bit because of the crowd noise and how 49ers have to either go silent count or the offense alignment are looking at the ball. And as Brunskill points out, sometimes when you're, you know, you're watching the snap count or watching the ball move, you know, you might have a run play going the other direction. And so that kind of throws them off. So slide edge there goes to the lions. That might be the one area where when you look at it, if the lions are going to make this a game, they kind of have to, that's where they have to do it. I think they have to really stuff the 49ers um, both run game and passing game by really getting that thing going with the defensive line against the 49ers offensive line. I agree. All right. When we come back, we're going to talk about the 49ers defense. One of the most feared units back in the day. Are they going to reclaim that crown after being healthy this year? We'll see. We'll find out when we come back on first bite with Matt Mayoko. Just a quick pause. We'll jump right back into it and get you out of here in uh, 10, 15 minutes. Sound good? Okay, cool. <clears throat> By the way, thank you, Conan, for the, the sub. I know I have alerts turned off because uh, audio is usually kind of quiet on Zooms here. All right, give me a second. And we are back here on First Bite talking about Lions 49ers week one with Matt Mayoko of NBC Sports Bay Area. Um, Let's talk about that 49ers defense. Um, Last year was fascinating to me because they had all those injuries that we talked about earlier. 
they were 17th in point th- points allowed still, which is pretty good. And then you look over to DVOA, which is one of my favorite statistical measures, which measures play-by-play efficiency. They were sixth. And so they were actually still pretty darn good last year, but they lose all those coaches we talked about. They lose Solomon Thomas, Richard Sherman. So just, Matt, what are your overall expectations for this defense? Is it, is it going to be another top 10 unit this year? I would be surprised if it's not. Yeah. I mean, for the reasons you outlined, uh, they didn't have Nick Bosa, but – basically what one game and one quarter last year, right? They didn't have D Ford for the final 15 games. Um, their defensive line, you know, it doesn't, man, I'm, I'm a big DeForest Buckner fan. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I was like, when they traded him, I thought, you know, is that yeah. something you really want to do, you know, to get rid of one of your, your best players, but they just kind of restocked that defensive line. And, you know, Chris Kosarek, I don't know how he's thought of there. Oh, we, but he liked, we liked him. He was a, he was one that, got, that a rare one that got away. In yeah. Detroit. Yeah. He, he's, he's got these guys yeah. playing hard. Uh, you know, he wants them to be the tone setters. And I think they're going to be, and they can roll in, you know, you, they can roll in four backup defensive linemen who may not be as good um, as the, the starters. But at some spots they are, you know, there's not much drop off. You know, I first off say that, you know, Nick Bosa is kind of on a different level and coming off the ACL, holy cow, you should see this guy. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's dropped to like 3% body fat, all of the combine stuff that he does, all the combine workouts while he's rehabbing from the ACL were faster and more explosive and stronger and everything than he was when he's preparing for the combine. So they expect him to be better than he was as a rookie. Mm. He hasn't taken a snap against another team yet. So I know that's kind of hard to project and say that, but that's how good he looks. Uh, D Ford, I'm still kind of seeing w- what that's all about coming off the, the back injury. We'll, we'll see, but he looks good. Um, yeah, they, they got a, a really good defensive front and that's where it all starts. They're going to be aggressive. They're going to be attacking, you know, Fred Warner in the middle is, is a nightmare. That should be, you know, that should be a, a great matchup. Um, if he's, you know, if, if he's covering TJ Hawkinson, uh, but they've also kind of added something to his plate, which is, you know, after signing the big contract, now they, they've also kind of said, Hey, we, we want you to do more than just sideline to sideline tackle and lock down, you know, either backs coming out of the backfield, tight ends or slot receivers coming over the middle. Uh, that's enough to earn your money. But I think they want him to attack the line of scrimmage more. I think they want him to make plays in the backfield. You know, they want him to, to blitz on occasion where they have to kind of figure this thing out is if you have him doing those things that he doesn't, he hasn't really done in the past. Are you taking away from what he does best? All that said, um, you know, there, there are some issues in the secondary as mostly as it pertains to depth, but th- this defense looks pretty good and it, it can definitely be at that level that they were in 2019. And, and like you said, man, it's crazy with all the injuries they had last year that they were still as productive as they were. So I think with a healthy team to start this season, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're looking forward to getting out there and playing some football on Sunday. And I tell you what, they've always had pretty good success against Jared Goff. And and I would, as I look at this game, it's going to be really difficult. I think for the lions to move the ball through the air against the 49ers. I I just don't, I I would be really surprised if if he has more than 200 yards passing. Now, maybe if the, if the game gets out of hand and I'm not saying it will, it's crazy. Like, I don't want to make it sound like I think the 49ers are going to blow the Lions out because I know crazy stuff happens week one, especially, yeah. yep. but, um, but I, I would be really surprised if the Lions have much success at all throwing the football against the 49ers. Yeah. That, that doesn't come as a surprise to us. The golf golf has not impressed that much in camp. And so I think a lot of people might be expecting mm-hmm. the same thing on our side. Yeah, and, and, and it doesn't come as much of a surprise to us, like Jeremy said, because, you know, the Lions are currently undergoing this changeover uh, in the wide receiver room. Um, Tyrell Williams and 
uh, you know, trading for Trinity Benson and, and some other things, uh, picking up Kadero Hodge. But when I look at that 49ers secondary, Matt, I, I, I see newcomers. I see Jason Verrett. Um, you know, I, I, I see Josh Norman, who, who was a recent signing. Like, I, I see some old some old faces in a new place. And without Richard Sherman there, lose, losing, you know, Akella Witherspoon, um, I think that that's another, another big loss for them. Is that something that they feel confident in building and they feel confident on their back end because of all the pressure they can generate up front with Kinlaw and Bosa and, and, and that, and that crew? Yeah. You know, Verrett played like, you know, he, he came to the 49ers in 2019 and was still injured, did not play last year. They really weren't counting on him, although they saw enough behind the scenes to bring him back on a one-year deal. And when he got out there about week two or three, he was pretty much forced into the lineup due to injuries he played lights out. He had a really good season last year and looked like, you know, the old Jason Verrett. And he's still young, by the way, but especially <laughs> young in football years because, right. you know, he's been on the sideline for most of his career. Right. Emmanuel Mosley is a pretty solid cornerback. We'll see what his situation is. He wasn't out of practice on, on Monday. Uh, Josh, as you mentioned, that they signed Josh Norman this week. I don't know how much they're expecting from him early on, um, but – you know, some of the guys that you mentioned, I don't think it's, it's, they, Akella Weatherspoon had kind of worn out as a welcome here. Um, I don't think he was really someone that, that meshed well with, with the, what they're trying to do and the mindset they're trying to have on defense. Um, Sherman played some good football, was a good guy in the locker room, obviously had uh, some off field issues here a few months ago. But I think the defense was pretty limited with him out there because you know, he could really only do one thing at this stage of his career. He is a cover three cornerback. And now I think they can be more varied. They can be more multiple with their coverages. And I think you'll see that. So, you know, I, I think that they feel pretty good about some of the, the top guys, you know, their starters. And then once you get into the reserves, it becomes a little bit more hit and miss. You know, how long is it going to take for them to get Josh Norman up to speed? You know, Dante Johnson is a guy who's been around the 49ers a while, and he's been a guy that um, has always kind of been on that periphery. You know, 53-man roster, practice squad, 53-man roster, practice squad, but he's reliable. And they just cut him to bring in Josh Norman. Today they re-signed him to the practice squad it wouldn't surprise me just because they know what they're getting from him would not surprise me at all if they elevate him on saturday to be active for the game on sunday so that's something to kind of keep an eye on but now yeah, you're right i think there are some legitimate questions in the defensive backfield after you get past the starters uh, i just want to want to answer or ask one more question about the the defense and it's it's probably a matchup that most lines fans are going to keep their eye on and it's at right tackle and obviously Panay Sewell went through some struggles in the preseason. So my question to you is, who is he going to see most of the game? Are, are they going to rotate a bunch of guys, or, or is there one guy that, that's just going to attack? Yeah, I, I would think that, you know, in, in, run, in base situations, it's going to be Eric Armstead mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, two Oregon guys going, going yeah. head to head. Yep. In passing situations, uh, I think that he'll see all three of those guys. I think he's going to see Nick Bosa. I think he's going to see D Ford and he's going to see Samson Ebukam. So I, I, I would guess, you know, I was just, in fact, I was just talking to Chris Kosarek about this today. Mm -hmm. You know, how much are they going to go into this game and talking about the 49ers defensive line with a set rotation? You know, this is how much these guys are going to play. This is how much, or when they're going to play and how much of it is just kind of reading the room and going with the hot hand and, and getting a feel for how the game's going. And Chris Kosarek told me that it's going to be a little bit of both. You know, they go in with a plan. They have an idea of how much they want each guy to play, but ultimately if a guy's on a roll, they're going to go with it. Yeah. So if they kind of sense some, some blood in the water with, with uh, Panay Sewell, well, they're going to keep hammering that home yeah. and they're going to make the lions. And I'm sure the lions will give him a lot of help, yep. but if they're having success with one thing, they're going to keep going at it. And so I think that that's what you're going to see is I think everybody's going to kind of get their shot there. Um, I would think anytime Bosa is over on that side, they got to give him help. Yep. They got to give him help because Bosa is an absolute game wrecker. And, um, 
that'll be something definitely something to watch and you know Taylor Decker's, you know, he's going to have his hands full too, you know, whoever's over there. Buckeye versus Buckeye potentially there too. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) So it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to see. And, you know, you're all these questions. It's great to hear these questions because these are the same questions that people over here are asking too. Like who's going to be lining up over there? How much are they going to do this? How much are they going to do that? And that's kind of the fun thing about a season opener, especially a season opener with a new coordinator or in the case, you know, uh, with the lions, a new head coach and two new coordinators, you know, what's this going to look like? Because you can kind of get an idea by watching the preseason games, but not really. Right. <laughs> yep. Not at all. Um, but we're going to try to do the impossible here. And despite the limited uh, evidence on both sides, we're going to make a prediction here in a segment that we like to call one thing we think we know, and it doesn't have to be a prediction of the game score. It doesn't have to be a prediction of the winner, but we like to just make one prediction about what we think is going to happen. And we'll start with Ryan. Ryan, what's the one thing you think you know about week one Lions versus 49ers? I think the one thing I think I know, and Matt alluded it to it earlier <clears throat> when it comes to Jared Goff's history with the 49ers, I think that Jared Goff is going to complete less than 50% of his passes. Oof. I think that Jared Goff is really going to struggle. I, I think that you look at that front line of that 49ers defense, you know, it was either I was going to take a shot at Jared Goff or I was going to say that TJ Hawkinson might have less than two catches because <laughs> Fred Warner is the, t- yeah. he's the kind of linebacker that can just absolutely wipe out. Right. He, he's the he, team's top tight end. He's like, the guy no that we problem. all want Derek Barnes to be eventually. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, I, I see, I see tough sledding ahead for, for Jared Goff in the passing offense. All right. I'll throw it to you, Matt. What's the one thing you think, you know, about week one? Well, I was going to, I was going to say something along those lines. I was going to say <laughs> that uh, Jared Goff would have under 150 yards passing, Ooh. but I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'm going <laughs> to say this. I've covered some really bad teams with the 49ers and it's amazing how even with bad teams week one at home somehow find a way and i'm not going to go so far as to say the lions are going to win this game but i will say even though i fully expect jared goff and the the lions passing game to struggle i think the lions are going to make it close i I think it's going to go into the fourth quarter and i think it's going to be close um Obviously, I wouldn't be shocked if it's a blowout. But, <laughs> but disclaimer, I've seen, a disclaimer. I've, yeah, always. A, but I've, like I said, man, I saw the Jim Tom Sula year. The 49ers on a Monday night beat the Vikings, and the Vikings had a really good team and went to the playoffs. And the 49ers had maybe one more win the entire season. So there's something about week one at home, a bad team. And let's face it, I mean, the Lions are going to struggle to win games, I would yeah. think. Yeah. But this could be the game where they just kind of like have, I, I wouldn't say an out of body experience, but they, <laughs> there's something about week one sure. where you just don't know. So I'm, that's my, that's my bold prediction is like that it. Lions are going to keep this a lot closer than they have a right to keep it. They just channel, they channel that 1981 energy right now. <laughs> that is right. By the way, chat, chat, chat did confirm that that was a Lions win. I don't remember. What okay. The score there was, we go. But... Hey, there we go. Yeah, what I say? There you go. Uh, the one thing I think I know of the game, the first thing I was going to say is that there's going to be Darren Fells basically locked at Panay Sewell's hip the entire game, but you kind of stole my thunder there, Matt. Uh, so I will go with something else. I will go that the, the 49ers will break at least three plays of 40-plus yards in this game um, because because of what Dan Campbell said in his, his press conference on Monday. The 49ers love eye candy on offense. They love to trick your eyes. They love to, you know, put motion one way, go the other way. And the Lions have one of the youngest defenses in the league. And I think, you know, all the, you know, film watching you can do doesn't replace uh, experience, doesn't explain, doesn't replace snaps. And so a lot of these guys are going to be seeing things they've never seen before uh, on the field. And I think that's, that's going to be maybe, maybe the biggest mismatch I think of, of the uh, entire game really is, is Kyle Shanahan versus Lions young defenders. Yeah, they they do an incredible job of selling one play yeah. and then doing something completely different. Exactly. And Kyle Juszczyk, the fullback, is a master at just his change of direction and how it looks looks like he's going into one hole to block and then just sticks his foot in the ground and goes another direction. And as we mentioned, Raheem Mostert doesn't need much of a seam at all, and he's gone. Yeah. 
and just in the threat of the run will open stuff up in the pass game. And you will see two or three times in this game where a 49ers receiver could be George Kittle, could be Debo Samuel, Brandon, I, whomever he's going to be running wide open down the field. And it, it was, it's based on what the defense thought they were getting yep. in the first couple moments of the snap or even pre-snap and then what they actually end up doing. So that might be a, that might be a very good call as well. That's Matt Mayoko. He is the beat writer for the 49ers for NBC Sports Bay Arena. You can find him at Mayoko NBCS. That's M-A-I-O-C-C-O, correct? That is correct. Nailed it. All right. <laughs> and that'll do it for our first preview of the season. We thank you, Matt, for, for joining us and bringing us a fantastic breakdown of the, the 49ers game. Maybe I'll see you there on, on Sunday as well in the press box. Uh, but until next time, thank you all for listening. We'll be back uh, for uh, a game recap on Sunday night right here on our Twitch channel live, twitch.tv slash Pride of Detroit, or through any of the podcast platforms you like to listen to us. But until next time, it's chaos. Be kind.